geology, geology, geology. Hey! Hi, Daniel. Yeah. Hi, Chris. How's it going? Finally. Oh, yeah, I've got three, three, three daughters, so uh, um, I, uh, they might come in the background call here. Them. <laughs> this is this is Olive. Uh, hey, Olive. Hey. This is Nora. Hey, Nora. And third one, who's that? That's Hazel. That's Hazel. So, what is that doing? What is he? What does he do what, what all day? Geology. Geology. Olive knows. What do I do then, girls? What's What's my job? You work on rocks and rock papers. Yeah, I had to do a project. I think I've seen Mount Ed. Close this door and take that, Olive, just one second, Olive, take that out of your mouth. I better put these headphones back on because otherwise we might hear the piano. And what about your wife? I'm not sure. When, I, I was making pizza sauce, so she might be just making sure that the pizza sauce is okay. So, Chris, I, I went through your uh, presentations that you made uh, lately this uh, Christmas uh, vacation. And uh, I like in one podcast, uh, the very last sentence you say, which is, who is talking about science is as important as the science done. And yeah. so, so today I'd like to dig into your personality, your thoughts, your dreams, your nightmares, uh, uh, because uh, you have taken this decision to move from the position of Equinor Professor of Bayesian Analysis, yeah, this is at the mm -hmm. Imperial College in London, to a new position as Chair in Sustainable Geosciences at Manchester University, right? Yeah. So I think that this could be a keystone in your career. And uh, I would like to unravel this situation. I would like to go through you, through <laughs> your uh, processes uh, and that, that happen in your mind, in your family, uh, to take this important uh, move. I think that is important. And I think that try to communicate how you feel in this uh, situation, how you felt because the decision is taken, is something that you will never catch, you will never grasp, you will never <laughs> write anywhere. And, uh, and so I can imagine you when you will be 64, like the Beatles <laughs> say, <laughs> and, and you won't remember anymore this uh, decision. <laughs> so I don't remember the decision already, Daniel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess it's a question come comment you've made there and it, it is it is a it is a it is a, a it, it feels like a, a big moment in my life if you will because uh, people don't at least in academia they don't change jobs that often I've been in Imperial College for 16 and a half years so um, it's been my only academic job since I left industry um, I was at a university which was very well, reg re well regarded, quote unquote, by certain measures. Uh, and I'd done, you know, I'd done well, ob you know, objectively speaking in that system, right? So I'd, I'd sort of benefited from being there, or at least I'd, I'd sort of progressed my career well there. And so the question is, is why would you leave that? Um, I think there's a number of pushes and pulls to that decision. Um, I mean, in terms of the pulls, um, I think after a certain time of being in a certain location, you probably crave some different intellectual stimulation. You, and certainly for somebody like me who has very multidisciplinary interests, I like people to kind of fire in problems and, and solutions that they've got to problems they don't even know they have already and and I like that kind of rich environment I think after you've been in a place for a long time there's a turnover of staff in that one place but I think moving is a really great way of getting that that extra stimulation intellectually and academically so in terms of the pool so the things that attracted me to Manchester the sustainable geoscience title is obviously attractive now it's important for me to say, because this is something that a lot of people have sort of not 
worked out in their heads. When I applied for the job at Manchester, it wasn't for a chair in just sustainable geosciences. That was not the position that was advertised. They were advertising for a position in um, essentially in geophysics was the title, right? And that geophysics could be applied to a number of different things. It could be whole earth geophysics, it could be shallow reflection seismology, it could be near surface geophysics, right? So they were looking for something different. In the process of interviewing for that position, I'm not a geophysicist, <laughs> but everybody knows this, although I use reflection seismic data. Um, in the process of interviewing for that job, you know, it became clear that I clearly wasn't a geophysicist, they knew that. But then as the discussions went on after the interview that sustainable geosciences was an interesting avenue for the university and the department specifically to kind of go into and actually having a chair, a name chair in that position would be beneficial for the institution and for the department. For me then, it was kind of interesting because I was already very conscious as you are Daniel as well about what the future of geology holds and, and what we're studying and how we're studying it. Um, and so for me personally, it was an attractive title proposition, shall we say. So it wasn't my choice to come up with a chair in sustainable geosciences. It wasn't what was on the table, but I felt that the conversations that happened during the interview process and sort of afterwards were, were very good in constructing why that was a good thing to do. So that's the, sorry, that's the kind of long answer to the, to the pull in terms of the intellectual benefit to me and the institution. And, um, and uh, I guess personally as well, just going back to Manchester where I did my undergraduate degree and my PhD, I love the area. I'm from Derbyshire, which is about, I don't know, 40 miles away from Manchester. So I like that part of the world. It's a stack load cheaper than London to live in. It's like the beer is half the price. <laughs> the houses are half the price, you know? So there's a lot of personal benefits, which are partly financial, but also just in terms of the environment, you know, just to be in a different environment and to be excited and stimulated by that for me personally, but for the family and, and the children especially, I guess. I'm 43 years old. And so I think, I think at this time in my career, it's a good time to go. It's not a retirement position. It's not like, okay, I'm 60, let's go and get this fancy looking chair at this institution and retire on it. I still feel I've got, you know, a few decades left of doing some really exciting work and working with some awesome people and living a really rich life. And, and, it, and it, the timing works perfectly as well. So that, yeah, I mean, they're the, they're, the, they're the draws of that position personally and uh, professionally. And what is the the your dream? What is my dream? Yeah, um, <laughs> what's your moonshot? How are you gonna feel these three decades that you have ahead of you? <laughs> <laughs> you, I love the way you think I've actually got some strategy. This is the mistake a lot of people have made when they've talked to me, because <laughs> I I have a very poor strategy about everything, um, because I guess in I guess in some ways I'm just very responsive to to people and data and you know arising problems in geosciences and 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 whispered words in the corridors at conferences that spark collaborations and i think the, the the most general thing i could say daniel to that question is i think a lot of the work i've done so far has mattered and i think we've made some i have i personally have i understand the earth a lot better now i think going forward though i'd like to think a bit more about how bits of what we do matter from a, a, a like a sustainable geoscience perspective right so what do I mean by that we do a lot, historically some work which is related to geohazards but it's never really been framed in that way so we've done a lot of work related to um, normal fault growth and rift basin development and that obviously has implications for things like uh, hazardous earthquakes we've done work in seismic reflection imaging of um, crystal magmatism so volcanoes and, and igneous and, and magmatic emplacement in the crust. And I'm really keen to work with people who have spent more of their time thinking about the, the immediate hazards to life now and how they can benefit from, you know, using some of the techniques and some of the things we've learned by looking at, say, ancient systems. So if over the next few decades I can learn a lot more about modern geohazards and then get additional value from the work we've done and will continue to do on say ancient things that I think would make me a very happy person when I'm 64 and about to retire. <laughs> Maybe. 
So Chris, I would like to ask you something now about the core of this move, which is uh, the represented by the title that you will have uh, the chair of sustainable geoscience in a university, an important university in, in UK. So I'm going to ask you first if you feel comfortable uh, talking about uh, the concept of sustainable geoscience. Yes, absolutely, because some things we sometimes you take a position or you do something because you know a lot about it already and other times you do something or you take a position because you want to learn more about it and that is super stimulating because lots of people have different ideas about what sustainable geoscience means i have a different idea some people are hostile towards it blah blah blah. we'll, we'll go into this i'm sure but it is a chance to shape that it is a chance to 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 kind of look at what's been done before and see how it fits into that and look at what in the future could be done Tell me off the bat, what is for you sustainable geoscience and what is the competing other concept that uh, uh, you can find uh, hostile or that is yeah. uh, controversial? Uh, yeah, so I think, I think sustainable geoscience for me is where we look at the role geoscience plays in science and society. And more importantly, or in addition to that, is how it, how it represents itself responsibly. So what it's doing in terms of the betterment of, 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 of humankind. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of things that have been done in geosciences where, where people are considering the betterment of humankind as, let's say, captured in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So let's say water and security and clean water. There's a bunch of hydrologists and geochemists who've been looking at this problem for decades and decades, and they don't need a title like Sustainable Geoscience to to um to crystallize their work and the value of their work so they don't need this title but i think what ge sustainable geoscience does is it provides a kind of a, a framework within which to look at how those things are all connected and also i think it gives all of those disparate subjects it, it gives a home for those disparate subjects and a way to badge it for the for the broader public and even even petroleum exploration so going on to your question about why is it often seen as who's hostile towards the term the people i've come across who are most hostile towards the term are petroleum explorers right because they see it, sustainable geosciences purely as a way of pivoting geosciences away from from fossil fuel location and production and they and they and they confuse sustainable geosciences with climate change and they and they 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 then start to question climate change and they just see it as another um downward pressure on on the on the industry i have hopefully always made clear and i've written some pieces about this and i'll say it again here that in the energy transition we are still going to require fossil fuel derived energy how much of that we're going to need is going to vary by um, geography right so some places are financially and and for different physiological reasons are, are better set up to to exploit um alternative energy resources like norway where i'm sitting now it's very different to sierra leone or nigeria or you know lots of other places so I think it's important to make it clear that I still see benefit to subsurface understanding being applied to fossil fuel extraction as well. So this is this is longer term though. I think sustainable geosciences is a, is a way of saying, well, how do we pivot away ultimately from a fossil fuel based energy economy? I would say, I would sort of go on record as saying that, but I'm not saying it should be by next Thursday. And I'm not saying it's going to happen at the same rate everywhere. Is the present extraction of hydrocarbons uh, sustainable? Uh, Let me tell you in another way. Is there a tension between uh, being involved in uh, geology that is applied to the oil and gas and geology that is applied to sustainability? Or there is no tension? I think there's there's an, there's an obvious tension, isn't there? But I think it's a bit. I think it requires understanding on both, on the parts of the people in both of those segments, doesn't it? Because 
if you are to say, well, sustainability means we have only we have concerns for the climate and we realize that fossil fuel and the use of fossil fuels is is a is a negative is having a negative impact on our climate change targets um and therefore we need to stop this tomorrow i think that's unrealistic and it's and it's and it's actually unfair on certain the development position of certain nations and it's a very complicated problem to get out of i think on the other side if people who are fossil fuel ex, you know companies are just like well actually screw it we don't really care about climate change and we just want to keep plugging ahead with this i can see why people on the other side find that unpalatable and i and i do as well i think i think there needs to be some sense on on both sides of the of the discussion so i think that tension can be there i think that tension can be there to to stimulate discussions between those parties chris your title is still today in your title is attached the name of an oil company, Equinor, mm -hmm. the former Statoil, uh, Equinor professor of basin analysis. And uh, you also, you work uh, for an oil company for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and more than 10 companies, they have sponsor and they still support economically your research. How, mm -hmm. how do you feel having collaborated and work for the oil and gas industry for roughly 10 years or more than 10 years uh, uh, now that you are in this situation? I feel relaxed about it, to be honest. I think, you know, what people have done before and what they're doing now can still allow them to be progressive in their thinking about what might happen in the future. And I've just said that I think that petroleum resource location and extraction will play a part of the energy transition. and. I think there's, you know, in my own political viewpoint, my own geopolitical viewpoint, to kind of deny certain parts of the world access to world leading technology and expertise that might allow them to improve their health and produce and improve educational standards in those places as a function of an energy based economy and a fossil fuel energy based economy. I can sort of square that, you know, I can sort of. I can make, I can get my head around it. And I agree there's the tension we just talked about. Um, undoubtedly over the next few years, I'll probably look at bits of my um, fossil fuel company, you know, uh, sponsored research and, and feel less comfortable with it. And at that moment, then I can say, well, I'm not prepared to take this money. I'm not prepared to do this or that. But Dan, I mean, I just see it as part of our evolution of thought as individuals and as human beings. And, and um, you know, I, I guess I'm not going to go around shouting at other people about what they should do, whether they should decarbonize their research portfolios or, or recarbonize them <laughs> um, on the flip side. Um, it's up to individuals to make that decision. I mean, that question when it's been asked to me before has often been posed typically on LinkedIn as, oh, you're a hypocrite by taking this position in sustainable geosciences because you have and continue to have money provided by um, fossil fuel and industry. But I just answer it in the same way that, you know, we're allowed to change how we think and what we do. Um, and we can, we can make our peace with various bits of that or not and drop them or pick things up. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's my, uh, my kind of most complete answer to that. And um, connecting this topic with the previous topic of communication, in December you had the, the honor to present the Royal Institution Christmas Lecture for uh, BBC. So mm -hmm. congratulations for this. And um, in the description of your work and in your short biography, uh, in the BBC and all the other um, venues that they advertise it. It is never mentioned that you work um, nor were supported by oil and gas industry. Uh, why is that? Is there a stigma or is there a way of communication of uh, BBC? Why not uh, saying uh, that uh, important piece uh, of your career? That's, I mean, I have no editorial control over what the BBC or Windfall, the production company, put on their website about me or what they write in the Times or the Guardian, right? So that's, that's nothing to do with me. Um, should they have put that in there? 
I think there's an interesting piece where they would explore it in the same way that we have just now about, well, how do you reconcile giving this talk about the geological record of climate change with the fact that you've kind of taken money from fossil fuel companies? So absolutely, that should be talked about as, as we're doing here. Um, the only thing I would say is I don't think it's relevant <laughs> to the, 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 the opportunity to the lecture. I mean, so, you know, there's a lecture about the geological record of climate change. I can still dispassionately look at the data and sort of say, well, here's a bunch of data about the geological record of climate change. This is how we do geochemistry, as to geochemistry. This is how volcanoes bring carbon and, 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 and uh, from the deep earth and, and we have rising levels of carbon dioxide. I can sort of do that even if I work for an oil company. Of course, because, and in fact, if you think about it, what's kind of odd is, and I've had this from a few people on social media and emails to my inbox, because what they're sort of hinting at is, well, you're biased. You've, you've taken this money from oil companies. Like, why is nobody talking about that? Well, if anything, my lecture should then have been a love letter to the oil industry. And in fact, it should have been a complete hour's worth of climate change denial. If my view was being coloured by some vested interest I had in the fossil fuel industry. And if anything, most of the criticism I got was about the fact that, you know, climate skeptics were like, this is all just bullshit, right? And I got the opposite <laughs> that I was, so I, I'd say, do you see what I mean? I mean, does that make sense that- Of, of course, I'm in your same boat. I have to disclose, I my employer is uh, Shell. So I really, uh, empathize with the situation. In fact, I would like you to to tell our fellow colleagues, uh, geologists, that they are still in the trenches of the oil and gas with this difficult transition. I would like you to address them, to tell them uh, what what do you think about their situation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely sympathize with people who are trying to kind of get in the industry, have made a uh, firmly in the industry or are coming towards the end of their careers in that industry. I sympathize with them because it is a very difficult time, isn't it? It's like any industry which is starting to dwindle. Um, people become fearful of their own, you know, it's kind of a real complex, isn't it? Because people can be incredibly fearful about their own circumstance and their own job because of global concerns, right? So it, it's probably quite hard to sympathize with somebody who's, um, you know, effectively what some people have referred to as climate change refugees in a country they've never been to and they've only ever seen on the internet when they are being called into the boss's office to be told that they're being sacked from the exploration department in some major oil company, right? They, people, will, people will struggle to see that connection or at least be able to kind of make their peace with it. So I do have a lot of sympathy. What would I say to them? Um, nothing that's probably not not been said already to them there are ways of applying a lot of the technologies and knowledge we have about the structure and evolution of the earth to other problems we have to other um other areas uh, which is of massive societal relevance and again captured in the un sustainable development goals there's very clever people have, have done some pattern matching between what we teach geoscientist students geoscience students and um, um, and how they could actually have a net positive impact on society through the SDGs. Um, you know, if they can look at that and say, okay, how could I retrain or apply some of those, some of the things I care about elsewhere? Um, you know, I can't give people a bomb that make, you know, I've tried and some people do get it. And some people speak very eloquently and more eloquently than me about them changing careers to jump before they're pushed from the oil industry. And some people are just outright hostile and they say, well, I don't care enough about these other people. I think what I do is super amazing and I just wanna keep doing it. And I don't really care about these other people. And I've even had people say, well, I don't think it's anything to do with, you know, I think there is anthropogenic climate change. I think it's really terrible, but all we need to do is just mitigate it. So the oil industry should keep doing what they're doing. And then another industry should spring up uh, who build in some cases what people tell me are dams or they should just build flood defenses or they should just get on with like doing um, what is it called geoengineering and like there's all these kind of slightly unusual things people are suggesting so they kind of just want to 
leave the problem somewhere else and carry on doing what they want to do. And I, you know, I, how, how do you get through to those people? You know, how do you, how do you get them to empathize at a global scale? Because they have fears immediately at home. I mean, one, I mean, yeah, I mean, one thing as well, you just got me thinking there. I mean, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if the oil industry is going to be smaller in the future, maybe we will see less people being trained to do it, right? So, you know, there's, there's less demand, therefore there's less supply. And therefore, you know, geoscience went through this kind of 100 year period or so where it kind of grew in importance and it supplied a certain energy for the for global, you know, betterments, although, you know, that's, yeah, let's say betterments. Um, and then it trained a bunch of people and then it kind of shrunk a bit and then there was less people being shrunk and then it shrank back to a number which was some notional baseline, which was then consistent with our sustainability concerns. You know what I mean? So maybe, maybe that's maybe, and I think Matt Hall, who's a good friend of mine, was on Twitter the other day, kind of saying this. We have this like notion of how big the oil industry. Well, we seem to, we think we have this notion of how big the oil industry should be, and how much money should be in it, and how many people there should be. But it's not. But it. But it isn't set, right? I mean, it's, it's like if 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 it wasn't that big and the energy demand stayed high, there would probably be political and other stimulations to grow alternative energy sources, right? And then there's a question about whether it can grow quick enough to, to make the gap up in the, you know, the, the demand versus the supply. But there's no, nobody ever invented a number which was a target for the amount of people we needed to employ in the oil industry. Or at least not that I'm aware of, right? I, I mean, economically, I don't think that's how it arose. So unless somebody knows otherwise. And just to uh, conclude, without saturating this uh, concept. I would like to know your idea because you have been collaborating uh, with different um, uh, companies in the, in the oil and gas and especially in exploration. So exploration is contracting globally. Uh, and in the, this is in the oil and gas industry. We know, we read it in the newspapers. We see the layoffs, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, geology is at the same time, geology is disappearing from the earth science department worldwide. Contemporaneously, the senior explorers are retiring and they're leaving behind a generational gap. So, yeah. so a vacuum of experience and knowledge is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, so who will be the gatekeepers and the proponents of the subsurface geology in the coming years? Well, that's what we need to concern ourselves with. I mean, we can agitate about the oil and gas industry becoming smaller. What we want is to be inspiring people and making them want to become geoscientists. We want to be telling them how amazing understanding the structure and evolution of the earth is and get them in any way, shape or form to get involved in that because we don't want earth science departments to close down. And if they close down because, oh, you know, so if the oil industry keeps contracting and all these oil industry people are like, well, but we still need to like, to have the oil industry but departments are closing down and students aren't being trained and at the at the upper end of things governments are making it harder and harder to look for and produce fossil fuels something's got to be done you know we, we there's a, there's a, there's an upward pressure and a downward pressure on the industry and and, and your question is is who's going to fill that generational gap some people will fill that generational gap of course Petroleum geoscientists are still going to be trained around the world. I don't think that's going away for probably decades. I think the I think the related question, or the more important question, is how many of those people will there be? You know, will it be? You know, because Imperial College we were producing way over a hundred petroleum-related MSc students every year. I think maybe at the high water mark we were possibly near two hundred per year from one from one department. In petroleum engineering, petroleum geosciences, minerals and energy finance. And even this, you know, we have we have new masters coming on stream now. And you know, that number may be 50 or 60, and that might that might that might fill that 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 you know, whether it fills the gap or whether it puts us at a level of a provision of, of, of expertise that is required to deliver what we need in terms of fossil fuel energy, that might just be that. I, 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 
I mean, I mean you, hopefully, Daniel, by the way, I'm talking about this, I'm still formulating my own thoughts about this, and I'm not an economist, and I'm not a petroleum geoscientist even. Um, but I'm interested in how, how dynamic the industry might be in responding to the upward pressure and that downward pressure, because I guess my concern is it might not be as dynamic as it should be, or maybe the maybe maybe the corporations are because they're driven by fiscal <laughs> fiscal concerns, but the individuals in it might not be. So you know the the, the the industry might be going, okay, we're going to do this, and then it lays off a bunch of people, and that's super shit for the people who get laid off, undoubtedly. But you know those maybe those maybe those those corporations are making the right decisions, even if it's just for pure fiscal gain. They're still making a decision which is consistent with sustainable. Sustainable sustainability concerns, um, but we need we you know I just guess young students now and, and kids growing up they're looking at the world through different eyes to what people were forty years ago. Forty years ago, petroleum explorers were the heroes, right? And miners to some degree, you know, they were heroes. You know, there was energy demand, cheap, just cheap reliable energy these people are amazing they're going out on helicopters to the middle of these oceans and drilling holes down to five kilometers and oil squirting out the surface it and you know, it, even talking about it gives you goosebumps right i mean the aspects of that are unbelievable the 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 the, the, the kind of the will and 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 and, and the, the the intellectual firepower required to do that here we are decades later and and people are looking at the world in a different way and and you know, people who are viewed as the heroes in the past are wrongly, in my view, being viewed as the villains and industries which in the past were viewed as the heroes, are, again, wrongly, in my view, are being viewed as the villains. The, the, the people in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the corporations. But that's where we've evolved to. That's, that's where we are with this, I think, now. And, and, and if people don't want to get into geosciences because they just see it, Again, wrongly, my view is only being for the oil and gas industry or only being for, for, for minerals and, and mining, and they don't like that image. We can, we can do two things. Is one, we can train them to do all the other amazing things in geosciences because <laughs> there's loads of that. They can go and do that as well. Or we can try and work harder at making a better image for those two industries, the fossil fuel industry and the mining industry. And we can work harder to attract people to it and we can clean up some of the crappy practice that's undoubtedly gone on in those domains. And maybe we can rescale them so that they are having less of a negative impact on, on, the, on, on, on the climate. And then position those two things as being more attractive. And then people maybe again will say, oh my gosh, there's these amazing people supplying fossil fuel energy secure you know and stable for these developing nations and that's really really awesome and, and the outputs from that you know are not kind of pushing us towards one and a half two degrees three degrees or some other kind of you know number which is going to be terrible for all of us so I, I, I am excited by the challenge and I, thought, I just kind of wish I guess more people were excited by that what, what is, uh, Chris, your piece in the puzzle that you are going to try to create when you move um, to this uh, chair of sustainable geoscience? Yeah, so like I said earlier on, I think part of it is related to research. So it's like what we do and how we're applying it and how we're badging it and how we're taking it out to the public. I think that outreach and engagement piece of, I think that outreach and engagement bit is a really important thing in this sustainable geoscience idea because I think it's really important to go out to the people who are being impacted by what we're doing and telling them about how we're doing it and why we're doing it in fact asking them and, and working with them to create projects that will benefit them right so it's not like oh I think this is a great idea I'm going to do this it's actually going out and and talking to people locally be it around Manchester or be it on the other side of the planet like what are the arising um, environmental concerns or geoscience concerns you have and how can we tackle that so I think that communication and and, and it's a cheesy word but co-creation of projects is an important piece another thing we've not really talked about which I know a lot of people are very passionate about and I am as well is that it, within this 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 idea of sustainable geosciences is is the the, the past 
reputation of geosciences. Okay, so there's lots of, we, we have touched on this, but conduct by certain companies and certain geoscience researchers in different fields, you know, paleontology is one that I read a lot about on social media where there's been a kind of imperialist approach to that science, you know, we'll come over here, we'll do this thing with your rocks or your data, we won't include any of your scientists, we won't leave any legacy in terms of educating and training people there, or incorporating you in this paper or this presentation, and then we'll leave. And then we'll benefit us in the global north, and you people here will be, you know, just thank you very much for letting us come here. And I think for me, having discussions around that and, and saying, look, historically, this has been not best practice. This practice has been damaging and we can do a lot better than that. And part of our legacy can be an improved global understanding and appreciation of geosciences by conducting ourselves in a better way. I think that's a really important part of this, which I'm really, really keen on, on learning more my, about myself, but also when I've got to improve learning is talking to other people. You maybe have heard about decolonizing the curriculum. That's another term which kind of was very talked about last year. And, and that idea is, you know, if you go and look at, I think you said this yourself, you go and look at what most people's stereotypical images of a geoscientist, it's a white man standing on a hill with the wind blowing against his face and he's looking all heroic with a hammer. And, and that's not, that's not what just oh that bit of geosciences is a very small percentage and racially and ethnically it might be a correct image but that's something we need to tackle as well so by going to our curricula and actually saying okay what examples of geos or where are we going to draw examples of geoscience principles from who are we going to show in the slides doing geosciences who are we going to have on our reading lists is it just going to be white north north Northern Hemisphere scientists who are all male, or are we going to think more openly and expansively about who is being represented in, in those different bits of how we teach? Who's, who's teaching? Who are we hiring to teach geoscience? Who's, who's in the classroom acting as TAs, teaching assistants? Is it all, you know, having a much more holistic view of everything we do in geosciences is for me, and it might not be for everybody, is part of this notion of sustainable geoscience. Very interesting. Uh, for how you describe it, the sustainable geoscience, it looks like a, an applied science rather than a pure science. Yeah, it is. But I think, I mean, this has always been geoscience, right? It's always been partly pure, partly applied. I guess what I'm saying here is, you know, and, you know, and, I've, and I don't want, I don't want to say sustainable geoscience is a new thing nobody's ever heard of it's it's that's garbage of course you know it's been done but it's just been done under a different name and i think it's a great way of crystallizing bits of what we do and badging it and taking it back out to the public and policy makers and saying look we people who look at the structure dynamics the chemistry the physics the biology of the earth we do this really awesome stuff and it's really important and people should take it seriously you know, and, and if that allows us to do that better, then I'm all for having that tweak in the branding. And I am super passionate about making sure we have a diverse set of voices going out and having those conversations. That's like, you can keep the name or get rid of the name, but as long as we diversify the voices, that's if that's the end where we get to with this, then that's that for me is going to be very pleasing. And Chris, going more into the detail, what are the methodologies that uh, you are going to use? What are the methods? Like if you uh, do seismic interpretation, you certainly have 3D volumes and well logs. What about in uh, your case for uh, the sustainable geoscience? Well, I think for me, I think, uh, I think for the technical bit, I think we're doing already a lot of that work. And like I said, I think right at the start of this interview, it's more of being informed by people who are trying to do things, let's say around hazards at the moment and what they feel are the the gaps in their knowledge and then us saying well how can we help with this approach we've classically used using seismic stratigraphy let's say in ancient basins so i think there's that bit of it i think in terms of the techniques of how are we going to do all the other bits to do with like anti-racism and decolonization of curricula and going out and not doing parachute science in other bits of the world that's a case of having conversations with people and trying to educate people and just talking very loudly and passionately about the benefits and the value of those things. Are there techniques? Undoubtedly they are. I am not a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist. 
for example, because I think those are things which are required to try and change hearts and minds, right? You know, there's going to be people who are resilient to this because their careers have been built on it and they want their careers to be built on a certain method of doing things. They're going to be hostile to that. And so we need ways of engagement with them. And equally, I don't know how, if I go to this country on the other side of the world, how best to engage with you know, the local population there or how to communicate science to them. I need people who have that local knowledge. So that's for me is part of the techniques, as you call it, you know, <laughs> that I'm going to need to learn over the next few decades to improve myself as a scientist and make sure I'm communicating that science as best as I can to people I've never talked to as much as I should before. So you are not uh, going to talk, maybe somebody naive may think, oh, okay, so Chris is going to move from um, studying the tectonics through the um, seismic sections and well logs uh, is going to study the carbon capture and storage. No, I'm, I, yeah, I'm absolutely going to think harder about that because again, historically, my research career has been based largely around, I guess, work which would benefit uh, hydrocarbon exploration and production. Um, there's clearly an operation, an, op an operation, an opportunity now um, with carbon uh, storage being viewed as possible, viewed as being desirable, viewed as being fiscally uh, sensible and, 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 and likely, and it's going to be a likely driver. I think it's hugely exciting to think about how can we apply some of the technologies and techniques we've had and, and ideas we've had, but to a completely distant sphere, which is going to benefit in a better way humankind i mean who who wouldn't want that and 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 who wouldn't even if they work for the oil companies their whole career or like i've been funded by them why wouldn't i think oh my god you know like i've learned all this stuff it's been applied to this thing this thing is becoming increasingly problematic there's this other thing over here i can go and have a material impact on and still be scientifically excited by why would i not go and do that And, and why would I let somebody say to me, Chris, you're not allowed to go and do that? <laughs> it's like it's not going to happen, Daniel, because, you know, that's 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 the evolution of self, which happens as you get older, that you 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 change your mind, you see other things, you you you, you respond in a in the ways that you feel is appropriate and consistent with your your beliefs and your value systems. And it, it's it, it's not a conflict for me. I see. I see. And also talking about teaching, I, I, I really think that you are now uh, having a metaphysical moment where you are thinking about how to teach, especially because you move from universities to university, you are traveling so much, you're in another country. So uh, what is the balance of um, your work, your, your, the balance between your technical work on tectonics, salt movement, sequence stratigraphy, with uh, your outreach activity of communicating the geological know-how to lay audiences? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, you know, sometimes when people ask me, you know, I've been asked to give talks and I often now just assume they want me to talk about racism or to talk about, you know, kind of science communication and how we you know, how we educate people about science in general. I don't think they want me to talk about my technical work anymore because I've spent quite a lot of time, I guess, in the last few years actually doing, uh, well, I've been doing just as much technical work, but I've also been doing quite a lot of um, science communication. Um, so it is, you know, your question, you know, how I balance that. I think that balance is still okay. I still feel that I'm doing as much technical work as I wish to do. A lot of that technical work is being led by PhD students and, and, and postdoctoral research assistants, associates who work with me. So I do crave a little bit more <laughs> technical time myself. Um, but I would say that the outreach and the science communication work I've done, and at various levels, whether it's going into nurseries and schools or doing things like the uh, Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, they're just as important and they really inspire me to still want to be a technical geoscientist. You know, I think it could be quite easy to have all of those science communication opportunities and just get sucked into being somebody who tells people about other people's science. And that's really important, but I am just the sort of person who really wants to still do that technical work and still press buttons on workstations and log core. 
So where do you, where is the threshold? Where do you see that threshold after which you you would say mm, too much uh, outreach? I don't know. It's a good. It's 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 hard to know. I mean, it's just a feeling. It's like anything in life. I mean, if you feel that you're, yeah, I think it's just a feeling. I think if if you feel that you're letting people down in either of those two domains, or people say that you're letting them down in either of those two domains, like I need more time for you to do this, and I need more time for you to do that then I think that will inform the decisions, you know, I, I would I would make. But that's the same if you think about things like work-life balance in general, right? So you work and you've got a home life and you've got your friendships and you're constantly trying to balance those to make sure that you're optimizing both, that both people in both of those groups are getting what they want from you and you yourself are, are, are happy. Um, and you can only respond to, the, to the, the, the verbal cues and the physical cues of yourself. And by physical cues, I mean, if you're mentally and physically stressed, you might feel that. And that might make you make a decision to not work so much. And equally, that could happen with outreach and engagement and technical work. If you suddenly felt like very disconnected at a conference because you didn't know what people were talking about, that might be a cue to you to focus more on, um, on the technical side of things. And when you have so many requests, uh, I guess now, uh, might be exponentially now uh, about uh, communication or, or talking, let's say doing outreach, how do you filter them? What are your pillars uh, on which you base yeah. <laughs> your, your decisions? Uh, what is worth it? What is not? What somebody else could do better? Uh, what is not time to do it yet? Yeah, I, I, this is a question I've been asked a lot and it's a thing I've thought about a lot myself. And you're right, I have got a lot of requests on my time. Um, I think I make my decision based on where I think most value will be gained by me doing that thing. So, and I mean value for the person on the receiving end, if you will. So there's a lot of things you could do which could cover you in glory, which could, which could benefit you but not necessarily the audience you're talking to. And it also means if you make that decision to talk to this audience, you, you, don't, you say no to this audience over here. And that audience that you say no to actually would benefit more from you spending some time and energy with them. Let's take an example, a real life example. There's two schools asked me to go and do some uh, talk to their students about something. And I'm really pushed for time and I can only choose one of them. If one of those schools is in a financially or socioeconomically deprived area and and or, you know, it's got a large um, content student body of people of colour, I might be more prone to say yes to helping that group. I think it, I think you're trying to, I think you're thinking about how you can raise the bar for, you know, not raise the bar, but how you can elevate those groups. You know, which which of those groups is going to be elevated and maybe can you inspire more you know in this quest for equality and justice you know where where is that time best spent in that endeavor you know I've had people say back to me when I've told this they said well you should go to this like private school and go and show them how good a black person can be because that would have benefit for more black people if you're you go in and you're polite and you're clever and all these you know, very mm. well do white people will say, oh, this black person came and they were very nice. You know, that would be a benefit. But I, I just, I just, I guess I just fundamentally disagree with the notion that I would have to go and be excellent and super nice to these people just to, just to get them to even conceive of the notion that black people could be, you know, polite and nice and educated. I actually would rather go to this other situation with this other body of students and actually try and inspire them and, and give them some material mentorship and, and offer to talk to them in other circumstances. So it's a difficult decision. And if I had a, if I had unlimited time, I'd probably say yes to everything, but we do have to yeah, make well, sort of decisions. Well, yeah, I think you also have to be careful because now you are reaching the tip point where people may also use you, your image your yeah, brand absolutely yeah and that and you, and you 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 see that already where people they they don't fundamentally believe in the cause which which they are stating right so they want equality diversity and inclusion 
right? And they think, how can we get this with minimum commitment of time and finances to themselves? Well, let's go and get this black person or some other racial and ethnic minority or whichever minoritized or excluded group you want. Let's get somebody in and get them to talk to our people about it. And then we'll badge that event. So it looks like we're materially doing something, but that's, that's a completely different thing to getting your hands dirty or putting your hands in your pockets. So that, and that there are definitely, there are definitely some instances is where I sense that or I've known via the whisper network that those requests are purely to benefit a very large body an institution let's say or a society without any real thought about how it might benefit me or the harm that could be visited on me as a function of doing that or um, how it might benefit the group I'm speaking to. And Chris, and now that you are rethinking how to teach, uh, uh, this is an assumption because when we generally change work, uh, you have a reset. But do you think um, <laughs> in your teaching, you're going to go beyond the technical um, fundamentals in, in talking about this part of communication that can change our community um, by itself? I'm always really hesitant about this because I think there's people who know a lot more about how to teach people and how to talk to different groups of people than I do. I am a geologist. I'm not teached in how to, I'm not teached in pedagogic practice. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a psychologist. And so I don't foresee a future where, where that is a formal thing which I deliver. Now, what I can talk about is my experiences in science communication. I can talk about my experiences of let's say suffering racism and what I think we could do about it and how I'd like people to change their behaviors and attitudes. So I feel I could talk about those experiences myself. Now, whether I could put together like a syllabus about here's how you do science communication, I, I really honestly think there's people much better at it than I am and could put it in a much, a much more implementable formal framework. <laughs> To answer that question in other ways, I would always hope that the people who I'm working with, whether that's students or colleagues, I will always be trying to impress upon them the importance of the communication bit, the, the engagement and outreach bit, because I think there's huge value in telling people about what we do and making people see value in it. I think there's huge value in, in that also because it may attract people to our discipline, which I just think is completely awesome, how, how formal that stimulation would come, whether it's see, well, here's Chris Jackson's guide to using Twitter or Chris's guide to doing science communication. I, I, I kind of feel ill qualified to do that. And, and, it, and also once you start, and it's like any course, isn't it, Daniel? As soon as you start, well, here's this expert comes in and tells us how to interpret size and reflect data or how to use Instagram you know as soon as you as soon as you platform it in that way it sort of makes out like it's infallible that there's no errors being made that every, you know like follow this cookbook and you'll get you know you'll, you'll get what you need and, and I think we need more honesty in in both of those fields technical or, or, or outreach engagement side of things we we are as a professional figure we are reshaped we, they would try to forge us and model us into something different, uh, being more generalist. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I can see the benefits of that. Likewise, from a pure academic point of view, you know, if you have a very multidisciplinary approach to things, it does allow you to draw on different bits of your expertise. It allows you to make links with other people working on other things and maybe optimize the sort of outcome of a piece of research. But in some ways, if you're a jack of all trades, master of none, you know, as the saying goes, you can end up not being, not being strong enough in one of those fields that's really critical. You know, like my research is kind of has that problem in that I'm interested in structural geology, sedimentology, stratigraphy, and I'm probably, and undoubtedly not as good as a specialist in any one of those areas. You know, there's a downside, maybe in, a, in some ways to a generalist approach but as long as you have friends and you can ring them up or you have people who sit in the office next door to you in your case you can go knock on the door and say can you come and help me with this inversion of this seismic data or can you come and help me with this petrography then maybe we've got a chance to do as best as we can and uh, in this case what is the university doing well it depends i think there's two ways 
of looking at that, right, one is how we educate and train people, so the teaching bit of it, and the other bit is the research and the academics who are doing it bit, right, so if you take the latter, so the academics, I don't think universities are deliberately going out now to hire generalists, right, I still think they're happy to hire somebody who's got awesome geochemistry skills or somebody who's a world leader, of, quote unquote, in uh, geodynamics, or, you know, I think they still are happy to get people who can do that. In terms of education, I think the education bit is quite different. It feels like that we are looking a lot harder now at what we teach and how we teach it and what's in a typical petroleum geoscience curriculum. Chris, before leaving you to the pizza sauce and, and trying to see <laughs> what is the mark that your wife gave you, before, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to give you like, um, a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, like uh, open mic. Oh my goodness. I think we did this before, Daniel, and it was very hard before when somebody says you can talk about whatever you like and things you feel um, very passionate about. Um, and I think since the last time we spoke, uh, a lot has happened in the last, uh, I think it's probably about 19 months since we last spoke. And, you know, clearly one of the biggest things um, globally and obviously something which has impacted me personally is um, the Black Lives Matter movement as, as, as kind of, which has always been there, of course, uh, but has been given renewed emphasis by the murder of George Floyd. And I think the, the reason I raise this as being something to, for your listeners to think about is, um, I think that the hydrocarbon industry has historically and probably continues to be somewhat conservative now, I'm not drawing a straight line between conservatism and racism, but I'm saying, um, a, 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 you know, how prepared is that industry, which is very white, to respond to, you know, what happened last year and, and the, the discourse that arose from it. Um, and so I'd really like, you know, the listeners here to kind of think about the longevity of the vocalizations that came early last year. So all of the outcries about um, racism, about racial inequality, about racial injustice generally around the world. But then think about that in the context of your own workplaces and your own immediate communities. So when you look around your companies or you look around your local communities and you know I don't know who listens to the radio station but if it's very kind of Texas based let's say or Houston focused then it's probably having worth having that look around and say to yourself do you feel that um, things are equal and just do you feel particularly that your own actions and your own behaviors are sufficient to redress the historical racial imbalances in not just the oil industry in terms of race and ethnic diversity, let's say, but just in terms of um, racial equality in the, in the US and in, and in those local communities. And it's something that's been said a lot of before and um, is still being talked about now, but the, the notion that be, not being racist is enough. <laughs> Some people will say, I am not racist and, and that feels to them sufficient and I and lots of other people and it's come well I don't know maybe maybe not lots of people are talking about it but we need more than that we need people to be actively anti-racist we need people to be challenging racism because not being racist in itself is is half of the puzzle because what that allows still to happen is pass is is for people to sit passively by whilst racism occurs the anti-racism bit is challenging that racist behavior and language when you see it arising. So I think people who are not racist are only half as far along that path as we need them to be. And I really encourage people to think very hard about being more active in challenging racist behaviors and practices. So that's my, my, uh, my sign off. Thank you so much, Chris. We were in in conversation with uh, Chris Jackson, professor at Imperial College in London, and uh, moving soon to Manchester University. 
thanks for being a mini geology, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you again. It's a huge pleasure again to speak to you, Daniel. Thanks for the invitation to come on the show. <laughs> it's always fun.